can we do this? I, I know you didn't know when you came in you were going to get a, a rose this morning, and that idea, I believe, was Matthew Hines. So I guess we just all need to give you a hand. So give Matthew Hines a hand. Look at that. See that? You know, you say, how do these ideas come up? Basically, we sit around and the staff team says, I think it'd be awesome to give all the moms a rose, and there you go. But uh, seriously, I came this morning, and I'm pulling into the uh, property and looking around the facility, and I saw all the landscaping we did back in the fall, and it all actually is popping up. Like, there's some nice purple flowers around the sign, and all the flowers and trees are actually budding and blooming. It looks nice. I've done that before where you plant it in the fall and then in the spring it's like this massive disappointment. Nothing popped up. Like I did something wrong. But, uh, but that was cool to see. And just coming in here, looking at all of you, uh, beautiful people, awesome church. I'm just glad y'all are here today. Uh, I keep mentioning Matthew, but just serving as our campus pastor, overseeing East Fishers, and really making this work. I guess you've been on the job officially a month, but man, I can already see things changing and uh, so anyway good stuff's happening well hey I want to do something a little different today uh, we're going to go a, a different direction for Mother's Day and I want to sort of pause the book of Acts for just a moment in your bulletins you'll see that we were planning to to talk about expecting great things and Acts chapter 11 when the church moves from Jerusalem to Antioch but I just decided today I'm going to push pause and I want to walk through sort of a Mother's Day message for many of you. Uh, I did not hear the prayer that Kristen was going to pray, but honestly, I think I could just probably read that prayer again and we'd be all good because that covers a lot of the characters uh, we're going to talk about in Scripture. So last night, I uh, chatted with my mom and just spent a few minutes on the phone. I'll call her today and tell her Happy Mother's Day and all that good stuff. But as we were talking, we were reminiscing about just a couple moments when I was a kid. And I began to think about my childhood and what I was like uh, sort of growing up. And I was not an easy child, okay, to raise. Uh, I had a lot of marks on my report card when I came home. I was pretty rowdy and rambunctious. <laughs> and so I just last night, I made a list of 10 things that I learned from my mom when it comes to discipline and becoming more mature as a person. So if it'd be all right with you, before we start, I want to read this list of, of 10 things that my mother taught me, all right? And maybe this will be inspiring to some of you mothers that haven't yet taught your children these lessons. Uh, this will kind of say, oh, you know what? I, I, need to, I need to teach that one. The first thing my mother taught me about was faith right? Faith. And she would often say, you better pray that'll come out of the carpet. <laughs> and so my faith deepened uh, in that. My mother taught me about time travel. And she would say things like, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> my mother taught me about logic because I said so, that's why, which now makes complete sense to me. Now that I have four kids, that's the obvious one, because I said so. My mother taught me irony. Keep crying, and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me osmosis. I said, shut your mouth and eat your supper, which is... A strange phenomenon but evidently that somehow happens my mother taught me about the weather <clears throat> this room of yours looks like a tornado went through it how many moms have ever made this statement seriously yeah a few of you okay okay <clears throat> my mother taught me unfortunately hypocrisy if I told you once I've told you a million times don't exaggerate my mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out of it, all right? My mother taught me the circle of life. My mother taught me uh, anticipation. Just wait until your father comes home. Just wait. And finally, my mother taught me wisdom. 
she would say, when you get to be my age, you will understand. And it's so funny, I do now uh, understand a lot that my mom was trying to teach me now that I'm raising kids. And, and my wife doesn't say any of those words because she's so sweet and kind and everything else. But I, if you push her, if you push her, I've seen a few of them come out. So enough of that. Well, normally I like to take a passage of Scripture, unpack it, talk it through, and uh, present it to you. That's sort of my favorite method. I'm more of a narrative preacher. I like to tell stories. I like to take the Bible and kind of put myself in the shoes of the characters and walk us through, learn life lessons like that. But uh, today I want to go a different direction, and I want to share for you uh, 10 very brief biographical sketches of women in the Bible that I pray one of these will resonate with you. So we're all at different stages and think different things when it comes to motherhood or uh, our moms or some of the lists that Kristen was talking about. But ten names, and uh, if you want, you can just, when they pop on the screen, you just kind of write it down. And if one of these names resonates with you and you say, man, I want to learn more about that woman, that mother, then I would encourage you to take that and go deeper uh, when you get home or in your Bible study or whatever. So we're just going to hit the, just the kind of brief summary of these, and we're going to go pretty quickly, all right? So 10 of them, that gives me about two minutes for each one or something like that. So we're not going to go all day. Don't worry about that. The first woman I want to talk about is the very first mother mentioned in Scripture, a woman named Eve. And Adam and Eve, I was thinking about this, Adam and Eve had literally a marriage made in heaven. Have <laughs> you thought about that? They had a marriage made in heaven. Like God said, Adam, this is the perfect wife for you, me, you know? I mean, that's pretty incredible. And they were able to live their marriage in paradise. I mean, what? how much better does it get? Marriage made in heaven and we're going to let you live it and have a perpetual honeymoon in paradise. And they were both naked, but we won't go into all of that right now. So, I mean, it was pretty incredible. They had a pretty incredible start. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, by the way, have you heard the joke about... <laughs> oh, man, yeah, how Eve got her name. So, so God brought Eve to Adam, who was man, and Adam said, whoa, man, that's my stupid joke. So, <laughs> woman, whoa, man, yeah, anyway. <clears throat> you thought it would be a little more risque, but that's all it was. <clears throat> Unfortunately, marriage made in heaven, um, lived life in paradise. Obviously, they fell, they got kicked out, and in the process, Eve was cursed because of her sin that she would have pain in childbearing ladies do you ever wonder what it would be like if that curse never happened i mean I, I i've never delivered a child but i can only imagine a lot of us are angry at eve right now uh, for that but they gave birth to the first child and i thought about like what that would have been like for Adam and Eve. I mean, there was no, like, what to expect when you're expecting book on the market back then. No Lamaze classes, right? Nothing like that. And Adam didn't know how this process happened. So, I mean, I'm sure he's looking at Eve like, honey, you need to lay off the tangerines or something because <laughs> you are just slowly getting bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, one day, Eve starts to have labor pains. Adam has to deliver a child that comes out of a person's body, however that happens, with a cord attached to it, what do we do with this? I mean, can you imagine if you're Adam? And this first woman was not only the first one to get pregnant, to give birth, but also the first woman to have to bury her child. And you think about why Eve was given the name she was. Genesis 3.20, we read, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And I find it interesting that the first woman ever created is named based on her role as a mother. 
There is something about a woman, some instinct, a godly drive, something that wants to nurture and raise and grow up and disciple children. And I want to say to each of you, I don't care what stage of life you're in, I don't care if you've had children or your children are raised and gone, there is something inside of a woman, and I want to encourage you to look for the the, the young men and women or whoever it is in your sphere of influence that you can mentor, pour into. It might be a neighbor, friend. It might be a, a, a kid on the street. It might be a, a niece or a nephew. It might be a grandchild. I don't care who it is. There's something about uh, women that want to nurture and raise up, and I want to encourage you to do that. Eve. But then that brings us to Sarah. So if Eve is the first mom, Sarah is the waiting mom. Sarah was married to Abraham. By the way, uh, in Scripture, we find out Sarah was an amazing woman. Uh, She was also drop-dead gorgeous, by the way. I don't know if you all knew that. Now, on my flannel graph board when I was a kid, right, they didn't have, you know, Barbie as Eve, but basically, or as Sarah, but Sarah was very good-looking. Pharaoh of Egypt takes one look at Sarah and says, I would like that lady right there to be a part of my uh, harem because she is quite attractive. Later on, Abraham goes and they come to this guy named Abimelech. And he says, I would like Sarah to be a part of my crew. I mean, these people, these kings, these folks in high positions of authority, when they looked at all the women and they saw Sarah, there was something about her. She was beautiful. She was also adventurous. She was a pioneer. She followed Abraham, like, into the promised land. Well, not the promised land, but the land God would show him, into Canaan. Left her hometown. She was adventurous. In the process, she became extremely rich and powerful. Abraham had a whole lot going on, a lot of wealth. We also find out Sarah was, in 1 Peter 3, 4, and 5, She had the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Woo! Good-looking, adventurous, pioneering, powerful, rich, gentle, and godly. I mean, Abraham, way to go, right? Had it all. But wasn't able to have children. And you know what? You can have it all, but... When you're not able to have children, especially in a society like that, none of that other stuff really matters. And so can you imagine Abraham promised by God and proclaiming that there would be descendants as great as the sands of the seashore, as many as the stars of the sky, and everybody hears this stuff proclaimed. And you ever wonder if Sarah was like, Abraham, can you tone it down on the descendants stuff because I'm 40 now. And I'm getting tired of walking into rooms, and every time I walk into a room, everybody stops talking. And every time I walk into a room, and about all their kids, and then when I come in, everybody stops talking. Uh, Abraham, it's, it's getting awkward. And then 50 comes and goes, and 60. And pretty soon for Sarah, you have to wonder, What is going on in her psyche, in her mind? We know what's going on through Abraham's mind because a lot of that's written down in Scripture. But for Sarah, the waiting mom, and then to find out that in the process of waiting and trusting in God, God would actually come and say, Sarah, you're going to have a son, and you're 90. Don't raise your hand, 90-year-olds, but um, you would laugh too. They don't have nurseries in retirement homes, uh, the last I checked. I don't think that, I'm trying to think, does Medicare cover pregnancies? Because I don't think it does. (laughs) Abraham, you're going to be 118 years old when Isaac graduates from high school. And yet, God came through. Ladies, sometimes waiting on God is the hardest task you'll ever face. Nobody likes to wait. Nobody likes to have to endure sometimes years and years of pain like that. No one likes to have to wait on the Lord, men or women. Waiting is tough. But what I want to say to you is God gave a promise to Abraham. 
And God has promises throughout Scripture that He's given <clears throat> to you. And you might be waiting and praying and longing and maybe at the point of giving up hope. I just want to tell you something. God wants to do great things, and it may not happen exactly the way you think it will. It might not be exactly the way Sarah and Abraham had lined it all up. I mean, they bought a 12-bedroom house because they were about to have multiple descendants, and then what's the deal? But God will do great things through you. I want to encourage you in your waiting to continue to trust Him and to continue to look for what God is doing while you wait. So we have a waiting mom in Sarah. And that brings us to Naomi. Naomi is what I would call the bitter mom. Now, I know you, we think of that with a lot of negative connotations, but let me just talk about Naomi for just a minute. Naomi, very traditional mom. She had the nice Jewish wedding, had a nice Jewish husband. They were respected. They were well-liked. They settled in a nice little Jewish community called Bethlehem. And one day... Life turned upside down for Naomi. They went from Jerusalem to basically a famine. I can't find any work, honey, and we're moving to Moab. Moab? We're moving to Moab? Seriously? I mean, we're moving from Hamilton County to, I don't want to give a city because some of you probably live there, okay, but that place? <laughs> really? That's what we're going to do? See, God had blessed Naomi and her husband with two sons. Their names were Malon and Kilion. Life was good, but after the famine, and all of a sudden, the whole family goes to Moab. Naomi follows her husband and with her two boys, and they travel, and they get to Moab, a foreign country. She has no friends. She has no connections. This is a pagan city. And when she gets there, her husband is killed and dies. So now it's her and her boys in a foreign country, a foreign place, Moab, all by themselves. I remember when my wife and I got married three years in, we moved 13 hours south to Dallas, Texas. It was difficult. She was pregnant with our uh, first child, Natalie. I can only imagine what would have happened if we would have moved the 13 hours, and all of a sudden she was stranded there in Texas, and I had passed away or something would have happened. But not only that, her two sons then, in this place, Moab, find two young ladies they decide to marry that Naomi doesn't want them with. These are pagan women, kids. I thought I raised you to marry a nice Jewish man, but no, you're married to these pagan ladies. And now she's the mother-in-law to these two women that were not her first choice. And then her two sons died crazy. Naomi is married with two boys in a nice Jewish household, traditional family, everything's good, and all of a sudden she's in Moab. She has lost her husband, she has lost her two children, and she's now living with these two daughter-in-laws that are pagan. The Bible says in the book of Ruth that she officially changed her name to Mara, which means bitter. There are no words to describe that kind of loss. What strikes me about Naomi is she did everything right, and it turned out wrong. I mean, she did everything right. She married the right guy. She had the right kids. She tried to raise them well. She poured into them. She did everything she could, and it all turned out wrong. And yet, as you read the book of Ruth, you find that hers is a story of perseverance because even though she was bitter and frustrated in the middle of it, she never lost her faith. She kept hope alive. And God actually worked out a plan of redemption through the next mother we're about to talk about, which is a woman named Ruth. Ruth. And I'm going to call Ruth the faithful mom. I like to call her Baby Ruth. Baby Ruth, all right? So uh, Ruth is 
pretty young at this time, pagan daughter-in-law, life started out equally as awful. I mean, imagine Ruth, like we're talking about Naomi, but imagine Ruth, she just gets married. Her ticket out of whatever circumstance she is in, and immediately her husband dies. I mean, that's a painful story in and of itself. How would you like to live with your mother-in-law right, right after you got married? I mean, that's tough. That's Ruth. And each one of these women, if you're noticing a common thread throughout these women, and you'll continue to see it, every woman had to go through a painful time, a painful season, for God to refine their faith and begin to build in them what he wanted to do. And so Naomi is struggling. And she has Ruth. And Naomi decides, well, I guess what I need to do is probably go back to my homeland. I know famine has ravaged it and everything else, but I just need to go back there, and I am going to try to pick up the pieces and start over again. And um, Ruth turns to Naomi and makes this statement. This is Ruth 1.16. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. What causes someone to say that? I have to believe that while Naomi was, yeah, bitter, and yeah, frustrated, and yes, struggling through whatever issue she was struggling with, Ruth saw something in her mother-in-law that caused her to scratch her head and say, I don't know what she has, but she has something that I don't have. There was something about the relationship between Ruth and Naomi where Ruth would look at Naomi and say, I want that. I see her praying in the midst of difficulty. I see her trusting God when everything else is going wrong. And Ruth literally moves from Moab back to the village of Bethlehem both believers yes both grieving but prepared for what God is going to do next and this step of faith this this woman Ruth to take the step of faith and go to this other place was rewarded by God by basically bringing another man into his life her life named Boaz who would be the father of their son Obed the grandfather of King David crazy what God did. And through it all, what happens if you read the book of Ruth is Naomi's joy is restored, Ruth's faith was honored, and I call Ruth and Naomi both faithful women that push through pain into God's blessing. What a cool thing. That brings us to Hannah, our fifth woman. Hannah's story is one of the most touching in the Bible. You can read it for yourself. It's pretty incredible. You'll find it in the book of Samuel. But let me just say this. Like several other mothers in the Bible, she knew what it meant to suffer long periods of barrenness. And to make matters worse, when you read the book of Samuel, Hannah was taunted by her family and friends. I mean, it's one thing for Sarah to walk in a room and everybody's quiet. It's another thing when your family and friends are actually making fun of you and taunting you because you can't have children. But that was where Hannah was at. And it's easy in life when things don't hit us well or we have opposition or persecution to turn to frustration or to lash out or to do a lot of other things to escape that reality and medicate or do whatever you need to do. But Hannah prayed. I mean, Hannah, in my mind, is the praying mom. She was the mom that said, you know, I know I'm going through a lot here, but I'm just going to double down in my prayers, and I'm going to pray that God would give me a son, and I'm going to pray that God would work into other family members' lives. And she prayed and prayed. The Bible says she prayed so hard and so passionately one night that Eli the priest looks at her and is like, that girl's been drinking. I mean, that's all I can say, and thought she was drunk. I mean, seriously, read the Bible. 1 Samuel 1, Eli thinks that Hannah is drunk she's praying so hard and fervently. I'm not going to try to imitate it right now. But imagine what that would have looked like. But let me just say this as a pause. Moms, are you praying over your kids? 
my wife and I, we, we go through this thing, and we've got to get this straight, but we go through this thing where we begin to disciple our kids and meet with, meet with them uh, as often as we can, and then we hit this low patch. We're like, man, we've got to be praying more for our kids and discipling them. This is our role as parents. This is our primary job. By the way, your primary job is to disciple and raise up your children. That is your primary job as parents. And, and we go through these seasons, and, but man, every night we try to pray over our kids. We tuck every one of them in. Natalie, sorry to embarrass you. You're 13 years old now, but we do. And we pray with them. Eli hears Hannah pouring out her soul to the Lord, and this is what we read in 1 Samuel 1.17. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And so Hannah perseveres in prayer, and sure enough, she is given a son. She tells God, God, if you would give me a son, I will promise to give my child back to you. Almost as a statement of thanksgiving. And sure enough, she gives, he gives her a son named Samuel one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. And Hannah reminds us that we have to pray without ceasing for our kids, for our future children, for our grandchildren, for the kids down the, down the street, for the kids in that ministry there, for our teens. They're on loan. Our kids are on loan. It's starting to hit me. My kids are on loan. <laughs> God has given me them for a season. And... Um, we can raise them, but ultimately they're gods, and so we need to be praying for them. Number six, I'm going to need someone to help me that is a, knows pronunciations. How do you pronounce this woman's name? Can someone tell me? Jochebed? Awesome. Jochebed. Jochebed was mentioned actually in Kristen's prayer. I don't know if anybody knows who Jochebed is. She actually gave birth to one of the most famous men of the Old Testament, guy by the name of Moses. And yet, how many here have never heard the name Jochebed before? Raise your hand. Okay. Isn't that amazing? Gave birth to Moses, and like half of us don't even know who this lady was. Jochebed. If there was ever a woman's life who would make lifetime for women, right, on TV, Jochebed. <laughs> I mean, she was one of these ladies, you read her story and you're just like, wow, that is definitely a lifetime special, uh, I'll curl up with a bowl of ice cream and watch her story on Lifetime for Women, because Jochebed's story is incredible. Story begins with Pharaoh ordering all the male Hebrew babies to be killed while she's pregnant. So why would, she, why would he do that? Well, basically, the Hebrews are like, the slaves are multiplying beyond the Egyptians. They're going to overthrow them eventually. And so Pharaoh orders every male child killed. No exceptions. Jochebed's pregnant. Well, she has this child and sees it as a healthy baby and decides, well, I'm obviously not going to kill my child. Maybe I should hide it. See if perhaps God will hide my baby and find his way to someone that can raise him well and sort of off in secret. So basically makes this basket, covers it with tar so that it's waterproof and everything else, and floats it down the bank of the Nile River. You know the story, same time Pharaoh's daughter is bathing, one of the maidservants sees a basket and brings it to her. Can you imagine, by the way, um, not that we all bathe in lakes and that kind of thing, but if you're like out in a river or a lake, and you're kind of off in the wood or the brush or whatever, you're like, there's a baby in a basket right over here. What do we do with this? And Pharaoh's daughter takes this child, and Miriam, Jacobed's oldest daughter, watches to see what's going to happen and bravely asks Pharaoh's daughter, hey, she probably sees some compassion there. Hey, should I go find a, a Hebrew woman to help nurse this child? And then, I mean, then you could... You know, maybe take it from there. I, I don't know. And yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Miriam gets her mom. Jochebed. I mean, this is like genius. And now she's nursing her child. There's a Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh's daughter's right there, and the child's alive. It's an incredible story. Jochebed paid, was paid to be a nurse and care for her child till he grew older. 
story, yes, definitely she has to give her child up. We'll say for adoption, but Pharaoh is, or Moses is then raised in Pharaoh's uh, court, essentially. She's kind of off in the distance watching this happen. And only later in life would Moses understand that it was because her biological mother, great faith in God, risked her life that he was alive. But Jacobet had to learn to let go. Now I understand. She had no choice. She had to do it. What else are you going to do with your child? Yeah, but there's a lot of other ways she could have gone about doing it. She had to learn to let go of her child and put her baby in God's hands. I would say for most of you, that might not be true of your infant children. How about your 18-year-old? How about your 19-year-old? How about your 40-year-old that still lives at your house? Get out of my house. Get out. I let go of you. You are let go of. Release you. But seriously, you've got to learn how to let go as moms. And I, I understand that in that case it was an infant, and I understand the circumstances, but letting go means trusting that God has a better purpose for their life, and I'm going to give my child off to him. That brings us to our seventh mom. It's a single mom. The widow of Zarephath. She, uh, she was single. She has some serious financial struggles. She was on the ancient version of welfare, we'll say. She had children that she was trying to raise, and quite honestly, she was coming to sort of the end of her rope. I don't know if you've ever been there as a single mom and you have tried your best <laughs> to manage your family and provide and you have had to work one, two, maybe three jobs to make ends meet. You have struggles that nobody else knows about. Whether it's single because your husband died or your husband did something stupid or your husband cheated on you or you were dealt a bad hand in life or for whatever reason you find yourself single and you bear the burden of that. That's where this woman was. Single mom, struggling moms. It was interesting that when Elijah came to the widow of Zarephath, one of the first things that he asked of her was to change her mentality and stop thinking about how am I going to provide and sort of the mentality of holding on and holding it all in and tried to turn her mentality outward. I know you don't have much, but I want you to take the little that you have and I want you to give it because I think when you start to give, you will see God replenish that in a new way. Look at what it says in 1 Kings 17, 12. But she said to Elijah, I swear by the Lord your God, I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was literally just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I will die. That's where they were at. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Change your mentality, your mindset, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops to grow again. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised. And I want to tell you, if you're a single mom, or if you're in a financial hardship right now, or you're trying to provide for your kids, keep the spirit of generosity alive. Keep the mentality alive that I am here to give. Keep the understanding, even if you're on assistance or support or welfare, whatever the issue is, keep that alive in you that says, no, wait, God has caused me to be a producer. I'm going to trust in him to give. Eighth woman. I call this the redeemed mom woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba. When you think of Bathsheba, I mean, let's just get real for a minute. 
you think of the woman who was the object of King David's lust, essentially. Now, maybe all of you don't think that, but when you hear the name Bathsheba, the first thing you think about is that's the woman that David lusted after when he was standing up on his balcony and she's taking a bath and he sees her and they have an illicit sort of adulterous affair, right? You think scandal when you hear Bathsheba. But let me just tell you something about Bathsheba. First of all, if you're brought up to the king because he wants to be with you, let me just tell you, you don't have a lot of options, okay? Bathsheba was married. But when someone brings you into the king's palace and he wants to sleep with you and he wants to have an affair with you and you're married you don't have a lot of options you can't tell him no so let's not just think that somehow Bathsheba was complicit in this and they were planning this thing out and you know running notes back and forth or something I mean David saw her I want her bring her to me he had her now you can call it what you will however that happens the woman doesn't want to be in that situation, and David goes ahead, and they sleep together. But I don't think they were in cahoots, right, to make this happen. Not only that, but then imagine if you then got pregnant by that person that you didn't necessarily want to sleep with. And not only that, but then imagine if that person... Um, decided he had to sort of wipe his hands of this whole thing, and so he sent your husband to the front lines of the next battle so he would be killed. So now if you're Bathsheba, <laughs> you've slept with the king, you've gotten pregnant, he has killed your husband, and then you deliver the baby, and now you have your child, and a few days later, because of the sin of David, your child dies. That's where Bathsheba was at. Bathsheba became pregnant again. Redemption came. David poured out his heart to God and repented. Somehow in the midst of the scandal of what led up to the relationship, somehow the two of them stayed together. God redeemed the entire situation. She gave birth to another child who happened to be Solomon, who happened to be the wisest man that ever lived. I mean, can you imagine if you're, like, feeding Solomon, like, you know, mashed peas, and your three-year-old is about to be the wisest man that ever lived. Now, it wasn't at the time, but that might be your child. You just never know what God's going to do. But God can redeem the circumstances in your life. I have talked to a, <clears throat> a few ladies that... Um, have experienced trauma in their life or some sort of issue, uh, have decided to have the child, praise God, and um, bring that, that child into the world. And in the midst of that, God does something and he redeems the situation and brings health out of it. And it's a beautiful thing. I want to just tell you, if your early childhood was marked with trauma, if your mom wasn't the mom she should have been, or if perhaps... Um, the child that you've given birth to, the circumstances that surrounded it wasn't exactly what you thought it would be. Let me just tell you something. God redeems situations like that. That's what he's about. That brings us to Mary, the ninth and maybe most famous mother in Scripture, Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know the story. I call her the submissive mom. Because when the angel comes to you and says, uh, Mary, you know, you are chosen, you're highly favored. Yes, you're a teenager, I know that. Yes, you're betrothed to be married to Joseph, I know that. But guess what? You're going to have a child, and that child will be the son of the Most High. And um, I understand you're not married. I understand this is going to look like a scandal. I understand that you don't know what Joseph's going to do. But will you submit to my plan? And Mary said yes. Not knowing. I mean, Joseph, the Bible says, he had in mind he's going to divorce her quietly. 
wash his hands of her. That's nice because he probably could have stoned her, really. I mean, she had a baby with another man. And according to Jewish law, anyway, that was the penalty for that. But he had in mind, he's just going to divorce her quietly, move on from the situation. Mary's wrestling with that. She's dealing with that. But she submits to God. She has the baby. God preserves their relationship. The baby is then raised. She knows it's going to be the Messiah, but boy, when he's 33 years old and hanging on a cross and she's standing there looking up at her son with John, and she's watching the baby boy that she gave birth to, nails in his hands and feet, and somehow out of compassion for his mom, Jesus would look down at his mom, Mary, and then look at his friend John, and say, John, um, you know, here is your mother, here's your son, and did that whole thing. That Jesus on the cross is having compassion on his mom that she'd be taken care of as he, as he dies. And we can talk about the details of that, but I just want to say Mary was a submissive mom to the will of God. Submissive to the point of having the child, submissive to raise the child in the way God would want, and then to go all the way to the crucifixion, to stand there at the foot of the cross when every other disciple left. And it's just her and John. And they're looking up at the Savior of the world, the child that you raised, that would ultimately redeem you and your life. What an amazing story of Mary. She submitted to God's plan. Can you rejoice in God's plan like Mary did even when you know it's going to cost you pretty dearly? I've had a lot of conversation in my household. My brother felt called of God to be a missionary to the Middle East. Moms, oh, that's a hard one. We've had many conversations around the dinner table about what that could mean and not seeing grandkids. But moms, let me, let me ask you a question for a minute. Those children are on loan to you, and ultimately they're God's, and will you submit to God's plan? Hey, mom, dad, I, I feel like God's calling me to so-and-so. Oh, really? You're not going to be within five minutes driving distance? Really? No, I'm called to wherever. Um, pray it through and submit to God's plan. And so I want to ask you, you're the tenth person, by the way. I wonder where you are today. I'm going to invite our worship team up, but I just, I wonder where maybe you are today. Are you, uh, are you waiting like Sarah? Are you kind of waiting for your husband to come around? <laughs> you're not married yet. Maybe you're thinking, Oh, maybe Mr. Wright's going to come around. Or maybe you're waiting for your kids to get through this phase. Maybe you're waiting for a child of your own. Maybe you're waiting for something to change in one of your kids. I, I don't know, but maybe you're like Sarah. Or perhaps you're like Hannah. And you're inspired by her story. And you say, man, I need to pray for my kids more. I don't do that enough. Or my grandkids or my parents or my mom or whatever it may be. And maybe her story inspires you. I need to be more of a praying mom. Or perhaps like Naomi, life has dealt you a difficult hand. And you live a great life and you serve God. And for whatever reason, God, through it all, you were dealt a difficult hand. And it's not what you signed up for, but it's where you happen to be right now and you're starting to feel bitter. I just want to tell you, persevere through the pain. God can redeem that. He will. Other people are watching you. Other people are watching the way that you process this thing. Ruth is watching you, Naomi. Ruth is watching the way you process this pain, and so do it well. It's okay to vent. It's okay to cry out, but don't lose your faith. Be faithful because Ruth is watching you, and I want to encourage you if you're going through pain today to understand that. Some of you maybe are like Bathsheba and you had a child under difficult circumstances and things didn't start the way you thought they would. 
But through it all, I'm here to tell you, God is going to redeem that situation. I believe that with all my heart. Or perhaps you're like Mary. The road is rough, and yet you say, God, I'm going to submit to you. Whatever you want to do through my kids, whatever you want to do through me. But here's what I do know. This is for all the ladies that are in our congregation today. What I do know is that we want to pray for you because your role is a, it's a big one. What, regardless of the stage of life you find yourself in, Eve, the first mom, was called the mother of all the living before she had any children. There's something about moms that are precious, something about women that are precious. So I'm going to ask all of the ladies, every woman in the room, to stand, if you would. Would you all just stand? I just want to pray over you. Just stand on up. Every, every woman in the room. And I just want to say a prayer for you. God Almighty, we thank you on this Mother's Day for the incredible role models we have in Scripture. God, I just touched on the surface of a few of them, but Lord, there are so many more even that we can identify with and talk about and say, you know what, my story, I resonate with her. I know what that widow Zarephath was feeling because I've been there. I'm a single mom. I've experienced financial hardship. I know what it's like to sometimes come to the end of my rope or maybe like Hannah to not have children and to know that people are making fun of you, but to persevere in prayer anyway and then to say, God, you gave me this son. I'm going to give him back to you as an offering. Lord, I pray for every woman in this room right now. I pray you'd give them courage, that you'd give them faith, that you'd give them strength, God, that you'd give them trust, and that you would help them, Lord, through whatever situation they're dealing with. And for every person in the room, God, all of us have a mom. Some have passed on, some are still living, some are struggling, some are healthy, some are sick. God, I pray you'd help us. Those of us with moms that are still living, to encourage our moms and to speak into them, to forgive them, to love them, to do whatever we need to do to let them know that they are loved by you. And if there's any woman in this room today, actually man or woman, that is trying to walk through this life alone, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ came, he suffered on a cross, and he died for you. He is your bridge back to the Father. He is your bridge back to God. And I would encourage you, if you have not ever done it before, to put your trust in Jesus as one that can come alongside of you in this journey, as one that you can surrender to and say, Lord, you lead, I will follow that's you and you say, man, I want to make that commitment today, I would encourage you, man, make a note on your next steps card that you want to give your life to Christ. Make a note on that. Write your name. You have an opportunity to bring that forward in a minute. God, thank you for this time today, this Mother's Day. It's in Jesus' name. We just want to thank you for watching the sermon online. If God is working in your heart, we would love to hear about it. You can go online, www.encountertrinity.com slash next steps card. You can fill out information there. Let us know what God is doing in your heart. If you need help with anything, we would love to help. Counseling, we would love to do anything that we can to help you go to that next level.